purely continuous state. You know, the, the fundamentals, the, the fundamental equations of dynamic programming actually have deep connections to physics. I mean, you'll see that they're called Hamilton-Jacobi uh, Bellman equations. Um, and I think if you, if you understand those and appreciate those, you'll understand uh, even more what I say when the continuous time allows you to see things that the discrete time formulations don't even, that just sort of hide from you and from your algorithm. So I want to work through that today. I want to take us through, you know, from taking, we made, you know, we were discrete in three ways last time. We were discrete in our state space, we were discrete in our action space, and we were discrete in time. And we're going to resolve all three of them. Some of them are easier to resolve than others. Um, <clears throat> so remember last time we talked about formulating optimization or formulating control problems as an optimization I gave one particular solution uh, you know that had a beautiful solution that we we derived from just intuition and then we showed you a, num a numerical solution that made this approximation right where we had a discrete state space with discrete actions that were transitioning and when we solved that purely discrete problem uh, we got a solution that did seem to somehow understand the dynamics. What you'll see when you work through it on your problem set uh, for this week is that actually the discrete thing, although it looks visually appealing, uh, it's wrong. I think I forget which way it's wrong. It's going to be wrong, like you know, systematically wrong, something like this. Okay, the the discretization errors that you obtain through these methods are often quite hard to bound. Uh, and they can be, they can add up a lot over, over as you integrate over space and things like this. So uh, there's motivation to go to more continuous formulations just in terms of accuracy. There's also motivations to go in terms of scaling to higher and more complicated problems. Uh, and I think we'll be able to bring better, more powerful tools to bear for some classes of problems. Okay, so Here's the basic setup, is that uh, we developed our, our dynamic programming update, right? We said that if we had a, a fully discrete problem where, sorry, fully discrete, I'll use S, n plus one. I'm gonna annotate this with discrete down here just to not have multiple Fs flying around that mean different things, okay? So it's the same as last time, but I'll just Annotate it with discrete. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have a cost function. I used G last time, but that was a mistake. I meant to switch for the semester to L instead of G because there's other, other uses for G. So we're going to have our cost function, our, our one-step cost function, forevermore be L. And our goal uh, in the discrete time setting was to minimize over some entire sequence of actions, some trajectory, for instance, uh, a long-term cost. And we considered the case of n going to infinity last time. It's not the only thing we can consider, of course, but uh, it keeps the notation the simplest. And we... <coughs> We wrote down this magical cost to go function where we said that the optimal cost to go function has the property that for all SI, the optimal cost to go was the min over actions of, oops, that's going to be a habit. If you, if you guys see me write G and I leave it, squawk, okay, SI A plus, um, J star of F D S I A. And of course our optimal policy we said was the the, the A that minimized this. What we're gonna get to today in a few steps here is basically 
the completely continuous time form of this, where we now have xd. So I've switched s states are now x in continuous. I'll even keep the t around so it's super clear. Um, I'll put a little c for continuous down here. x of t, u of t. My loss function is now, let me even put the d and the u on the loss function so I don't have two l's flying around here. Okay. And I want to minimize over some trajectory of u the total integral now uh, over time dt lc xu. And it turns out the corresponding equation here I could just say for all x and for all, you know, for all x, x u plus partial j partial x fc x u. And then similarly, the, the optimal policy as a function of x is going to be the argmin over u of this thing. Okay, it's not hard to go from one to the other. We'll do it carefully just to make sure uh, everything makes sense. But <clears throat> what we have here is this sort of is this discrete equation. We talk about you know an absolute. Um, you know our our step happens in a finite amount of time. We transition to some new state, maybe the next state on our graph if we're thinking about it. We look up the value here, right? And what we got here was remember two things we got here. One of them was uh, a condition that the optimal policy, the optimal cost to go function must satisfy, right? So it could be something that used to prove that you've got an optimal cost to go function. If you can produce a J that satisfies this equation, then you've, you've got something that's sat that certifies optimality. We also got an algorithm out of it, which was, you know, we took this and sort of made an estimate of J and pumped it into the next estimate of J and had an iterative algorithm that worked out to have some magical properties. So we want to have all the same kind of tools in continuous time, and we'll work up to that. There's a few things that are nice about the discrete world. Certainly if your problem is actually discrete, this is the way to write it down, of course. Um, <clears throat> when we did, if, if we're writing the code and we have a finite set of actions to search over, then taking this minimum value, there's, there's like nothing else you can do besides computing this right-hand side for all possible A's, unless someone tells me more information. But as it's written here, I just have to evaluate this for all A's and take the smallest one. Now, it's easy to do that. That's an easy algorithm to write, okay? But it doesn't leverage any structure, and as your action space gets very big, it becomes expensive, right? Here, we have potentially an optimization problem to solve here to find this minimizing U. And for some, for many classes of problems that are of interest, there's actually very nice solutions to it. Okay, so let me spend a few minutes just making sure that you see that connection. Um, and I will, I'll just do a very informal derivation of that, but I want you to see how this equation turned into this equation because it's really the same thing. It has to be the same thing. Any questions on that setup? Yeah? The O equals thing you, what is that notation? Oh, that's actually just a zero. Zero. Yeah. Can the J be in the equation? I could put a star. I should have put a star here. Yeah, thank you. Nice. Okay, so what do we have to do to go, um, you know, from this side of the board to this side of the board? Well, changing, you know, this is a function that's defined. I, I give you some vector, uh, you know, description of the state, some vector description of, of the action, and I come up with another vector. I, I could have written this as x 
or and you here that it doesn't you know the, the way I write that function isn't really dependent on those, the states in action. It, it doesn't. It's down. It's only down here when I think about how do I evaluate it for all s or all a that it matters. But the dynamics are pretty easy to change over. And in in particular, um, the natural sort of conversion from one of those to the other would be if I were to say first, let me just write my discrete time taking in continuous values. That's a pretty reasonable, I don't even feel bad using the same f for that. It's, um, it's a pretty reasonable replacement, okay. <coughs> uh, so we want to use, we want to, you know, find a way to, to convert between discrete and continuous time. And the standard way to do that would be to say, take a Taylor approximation of this. This is approximately x of n plus, let's say, h f c x of n u of n, where h is my time step. I like it to be small. This is a good approximation as h goes to zero. Sometimes people will call it delta t or you know, dt or delta t or something like this. And let's just be precise here. This is the, the notation here would be that um, xn is, is the analog for x of n times h then in continuous versus discrete. Okay, so this is a you know this is a first order approximation of the of the dynamics uh, using the continuous time form, and it's good as h goes to zero, right? We we'll do the same thing for the for the cost. You know, my l um, discrete of x of u is approximately equal to h times my l continuous of x of u, because I want this to be, you know, equal to the integral from zero to h of lc xu dt, right? So it's approximately equal to that. Now the interesting thing comes when, when I take my cost to go function and I use the same sort of uh, small, you know, first order approximation for it. So if I say that j star, sorry, xn plus one, approximately equal to j star xn plus h times, well, let me write dj dt first. All right, that's the equivalent of this. This is like x dot, so I want j dot dj dt here. So what's dj dt? Well, J is a function of x, so its time derivative is partial j partial x plus x dot, which is f of x. Now, just since I haven't said it yet here, so let's just think about you know, the size of that and everything. So, so this is the derivative of a scalar cost to go. J is a scalar with respect to a vector. So by convention, when I take the derivative of a, even a vector with respect to a vector, this one is going to be a row vector, which is you know, partial j, partial x1, partial j, partial x2. Okay, and if I had a vector on top, I would have multiple rows and get a whole matrix. And so this thing, and this thing, of course, is a, a vector-valued function. So you see, as, as I were to multiply f1, f2, f3, right? That's just taking the partial derivative in the vector form. So we've almost done it now. So now, um, 
let's write out our original problem, our original um, discrete time Bellman equation. I have LC. I'm gonna um, yeah, I'm gonna write keep all the ends for now just to keep it. Okay, times H plus something that is approximately J star xn plus h times partial j star partial x fc xn u. Good lord, did I get all my x's and u's and everything right, hopefully? Okay, so you should really just think about this as the Taylor approximation of that stuck in on the right hand side. Right, for I have this function, I stuck in the Taylor approximation, and I've got my approximation of this. Now the interesting thing is, how did I get that zero on the other side, right? This term doesn't depend on the u. So I can pull that right out, and that cancels this term. So this one comes out with that. And then one more step, I can take the h outside, or I can divide the whole thing through by h. That won't change my optimal min. And I'm going to take the limit. I want to take the limit as h goes to 0, but in fact, h just I could just delete it because it's a 0 divided by h, or times h if I bring it to the other side. So the h also disappears. And we're left with this beautiful, simpler, This is the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation, HJB. Okay, so that was a little algebraic for my taste or. Uh, too, much, too many equations and not enough intuition, but um, I think the intuition actually comes pretty quickly uh, now. And, the, and it's, um, I like thinking about it as dj dt here. Okay, so if I think about this, this thing as um, dj star dt, then what that's saying is, if I were to, t if, I, if I find the minimizing u, okay, so u star being the argmin over u of that thing, and I plug that back in, then what I get is zero lc x u star plus partial j partial x star fc x u star. Or, if you like, dj star dt, which is this thing, equals negative lc x u star. So this is a partial differential equation, right? It's got a, this is a partial differential equation in, that defines j. It's talking about, it's a, it puts conditions on the derivatives of j. Right? What conditions does it put on it? It says if you're following the optimal policy, then j, as you walk along the optimal policy, in all curves that are the, that is defined by the paths of the optimal policy, j needs to decrease at the rate of the cost gets accumulated. That's all it's saying. Right? That there's a, there's, a, um, there's a rate at which I'm accumulating cost under the optimal policy. And J has to, you know, has to be going down on the hill on that cost. Let me say it again in the 
picture of, a, of my grid world, right? So imagine I had a continuous grid world where I had my goal here. And we saw this sort of, you know, s the discrete grid approximation of the value function work its way out, right? But in the continuous space, you know, the cost to go might look like just the distance to the goal, right? That's that maybe intuitively what we thought, if you thought about the grid world, what you'd expect to have like the, the cost to go function grow out as a potential field, for instance, of the, from the goal, right? So that gradient there is going to be partial j, partial x, partial j star, partial x. That's defining it. I mean, it's going to be that one, I guess. j goes up as I go farther away. Okay, and that's what defines my, you know, in the simple case where I can move in sort of arbitrary directions, then J just becomes, you know, is defined by the gradients of the cost. In more subtle cases where F is not arbitrary but restrictive, then the dynamics shape the way that gradient, that, that function evolves. In the same way we saw the, the pendulum, you know, cost to go functions evolve farther as they, as they went away. Even the double integrator found a way to understand the curvature of the of those space. Right? So the intuition really is that that this is a partial differential equation. It says that at optimality, my cost to go landscape ma matches my my you know the time derivative of my cost, my my running cost. Okay, so there's a few places where it's actually interesting. Um, I mentioned this last time, right? So we had a closed form solution for the minimum time problem that we proposed. Um, and it, we had a J, that was the time to go that I plotted with the fancy plot the uh, animation or whatever. Uh, so you'd like to, I'd like to be able to at this point certify for you that that was an optimal policy using the, the language of Hamilton Jacobi, okay? The only problem with that is that this check only works if partial j, partial x is defined everywhere. And because of this discontinuous policy, I also have a cusp in the cost to go function. Sorry to be mobile on you, Alex. <clears throat> so, all I could tell you, and I won't write all the equations out, but what I could tell you is that the cost to go that comes from the, the closed form solution of the minimum time problem does satisfy this everywhere, except for the places where partial j, partial x is undefined. So that's suggestive, but it's not a complete proof yet, unfortunately. You have to do more work for that simple problem to prove that it's actually optimal. Okay, and maybe one more thing to say about it is that um, this is a part of the hamilton jacobi su hjb sufficiency theorem, okay? So, so with a few caveats and asterisks in the technical, um, that, that's written caref more carefully in the notes, okay, is you would, basically the statement is if you can produce a J that satisfies this equation and a policy which is the, R, which is the minimizer of that, then that is sufficient to prove optimality. It's sufficient to prove that your, con your optimal controller is, is op you know, your policy is an optimal controller for that cost function. There are a few, because this is a partial differential equation and we haven't said anything about the boundary conditions, there's some care required, some extra conditions that have to be met if you're gonna publish a paper on proving optimality, okay? So there's a, some care needed. But to first order, this is, the, this is the big one. This is the big condition you have to meet. If you can find a J <clears throat> and find a controller, then you've proved optimality. So let's do it. Let me 
write an optimal controller for you, and prove without too many details of the boundary conditions or whatever, but this one will be good, I promise. It does satisfy reasonable boundary conditions. So one of the examples I did, I did for the double integrator um, two cost functions, right? So this will give us a little exercise uh, using the machinery, okay? So if I have Q double dot equals U and my continuous cost, which is a function of Q, Q dot and U, right? Which I could, I could, using that language over there, I've got Q is just Q, Q dot, right? And so that's just X of U, but I've just spelled it out with all the terms. <coughs> And I'm going to choose it nice and simple. I'll do q squared plus q dot squared plus u squared. The optimal policy for this, u star, is negative q squared of 3 q dot. Now you should. You have every right to think, where did that come from? <laughs> why, why is there a square root of three there, whatever? You know, but I'm going to convince you that this is optimal by producing a cost-to-go function that demonstrates its optimality. Right? That's the way the tools work. The cost-to-go function, for now, looks almost as mysterious, but maybe you'll see the, where it comes from in a second. I don't actually have to justify where it came from to convince you that the thing's optimal, right? That's not a burden on me. I can, you know, it's like cryptography or something. If I give you a certificate, right, you know, it's a prime factor, you're, good, you're done. You don't have to tell me how to generate the, the cost of goes. We're gonna, of course, try to help you generate those later, but. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so dj dt, in this case, I'm gonna, Stop carrying this. If, if I stop carrying the star, that that's only uh, being lazy, I guess. But so this thing, um, I think it's helpful, I guess, just to write out the partial j partial x. I'm gonna I can write out both terms, right? So it's the first term in x partial x one times x one dot plus partial j partial q dot q double dot, which is in this case q double dot is just u. Right, so you could see you should see that the same as partial j partial x f of x u, right? Where this is I just want you to see see that all those things are the same, right? That's just different ways to say the same thing. It does mean I need to take partial j partial q and partial j partial q dot, which I can do easily enough. j star partial q is going to be 2 square root of 3 q plus 2 q dot. Right? This is just to convince you that the tools are the tools you know. There's nothing mysterious happening here. It's just a matter of, of working through them. So this is now 2q plus 2 square root of 3q dot. I can stick all of those in. Well, first of all, we can confirm now that I need to confirm that the min over u of q squared q dot squared plus u squared plus that whole mess, right? Q dot, Q dot, 
plus 2 square root of 3 q dot plus q u. Turns out if you, so, well, let's think about what this looks like. This is a good example, right? So there's a lot of complicated terms in here. If I want to take the min over u, though, there's only two of those terms. Well, this term matters and this whole term matters. The rest of them don't matter at all. And in fact, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a particularly simple function of u. It's a quadratic form in u. I could have, you know, effectively this is like a u squared plus b u plus c. That's what I see when I look at that. And actually, it doesn't even have a coefficient there. It's just u squared. So I know it's a, a positive quadratic function. Right, so this is a function that looks like this somewhere in space. And my goal to find the minimizer is just to find the bottom of the quadratic form. You can do that by taking the gradient of that quadratic form, set it equal to 0. Guess what you're going to get? The gradient of that just, and then you set it equal to 0, will give you exactly this term here. Okay, So it's all machinery that should be familiar. And even more so, I, maybe I, I won't write things out, but once you stick this into here, you get some canceling to do, but it all cancels out. One by one, it's a slash, 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 and you get zero out. Okay. So this is the optimal policy for that um, cost function, and this is the optimal cost to go. Does that machinery make sense? Yeah? Are you convinced? <laughs> Did I satisfy? <clears throat> Actually, I want to take a second to just think about this quadratic form. I'm going to come back to this board here. Okay, so what does that cost to go function look like, right? So if I were to plot on the phase portrait, first let me just plot uh, LC of Q, Q dot, and I'll just set U to zero for a second here. What does my cost function look like in this phase portrait? It's just q squared plus q dot squared. So if I want to plot the level sets of that, those are just circles. Right? So q squared plus q dot squared equals 1 would be something like this. Equals 2 is something like this. Right? Now if I want to plot the cost to go function, j star of q, q dot, it's lost its dependence on u, it doesn't have any dependence on u, right? <clears throat> What's that one going to look like? Well, I could write that same function in a quadratic form, it might be easier to see it like this x transpose square root of 3, 1, 1, square root of 3, and x, x and x transpose. It's funny. This is just a quadratic form in two variables. That's just a different way to write that same equation. Okay. So what I want to do to plot the, that quadratic form is to just think about the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of that matrix. Okay. It turns out that the eigenvectors, or the eigenvalues are square root of 3 plus or minus 1. And the eigenvectors are 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. So I can plot those here. 
I get a, my two eigenvectors and the smaller eigenvalue. The, the smaller eigenvalue is going to be the one that's a, a, a more elongated in the level set. Right? So if I were to draw, draw the level set now, it's going to look like this. Okay, where this one here is the smaller eigenvalue. So the square root of 3 minus 1, and this is the square root of 3 plus 1. Now, I don't know if you remember, maybe I should jog our memory here, but that's exactly what we got out of the value iteration algorithm, right? Oh, shoot, I closed it. This is the quadratic regulator cost for the double integrator. That's exactly the cost to go function that is very hard to see in 3D, but should show up here in a second. Almost exactly, up to the numerical artifacts. All right, see that? There are some definitely some artifacts. So the biggest one in my, to my eyes is up in the corners, right? That's, um, there's some boundary effects that the numerical algorithm has. Yeah, so um, when, I'm, when I'm evaluating the dynamics here, right, and I wanted to sort of, if I had a U that would get me off the end, I artificially project it back to the edge, right, which causes this, strange artifacts at the edge, in the corners, right? That's not as significant down here because the, the dynamics wanted to just come around here. But this one, it's trying to shoot off the end and it gets a big artifact here, okay? But that gives me exactly this sort of quadratic form here. The optimal policy is also lined up with this, right? The optimal policy looks like the gradient of this, it's got this u squared term plus the gradient of the cost. We're gonna see this very clearly, but, but it's gonna be lined up along this axis trying to push me down the cost to go function. Yes? Yeah, go for it. Good, so um, the way I wrote it before was just like this. And, I, and so I, maybe it would have been helpful for me to write it you know, in this order, which I spell out like this. This is just the, the, if I multiply out this matrix equation, I get this term times this, times this, plus this term times this. So that's the long form of that. And, and Q double dot becomes U, yes, from, from the dynamics. No, I'm glad you asked, I think, I appreciate that. Is that clear? That, that example should sort of uh, hopefully be completely comprehensible. It's interesting to, to ask some questions though. So um, if I kept my cost function almost the same, but I removed this, if I took the u squared away, what happens? Just on this step even, what happens? When I try to minimize over u this function, well, it's, it's, this will not be the optimal value function, any, cost to go function anymore. 
But if I were to just take this and try to go down, try to find the minimizing action given that cost to go estimate, that min over u, it's now a, a min over u over some limited function, or over a linear function of u. So it's going to only be positive or negative infinity. So that's probably not what you want to send to your robot. Okay. Uh, if you were to say min over u, you could say min over u less than or equal to 1. And then it would be either positive or negative 1. And that's roughly what happened in the, that's, what, that's why bang bang control happens so often. Yes? Good. Thank you for. <clears throat> phase portraits want to swing around this way. When you have a positive Q dot, you're, going, you're moving in this direction on Q. So there's always a sort of a flow like this around a phase portrait. What this is saying is if your goal is to get here, remember before we had a sharp path to get in here. This is saying, so the, the level sets of this are level sets in cost. That's saying it's just as good to be out here as it is to be here, right? You're closer to the origin here in sort of a Euclidean sense, but over here, you've got the dynamics working for you, right? Here, you've got momentum roughly taking you towards this, okay? So it's much easier to go from here to here than from here to here. From here to here, you gotta go all the way around. Yes, the only reason I didn't want to do that is because that's under a policy that's trying to do bang bang and this is under the smoother policy. So the curves will not look like that sharp thing. It's going to take a softer path in. But, but, but very similar, very similar. Okay, so um, That matches the numerics. I hope, I hope it's intuitive. That's, of course, many of you know that that's, of course, a simple version of the very general class of, of super important problems um, called the linear quadratic regulator. Right? So this is a problem that had linear dynamics. Q double dot equals U. It's the simplest linear dynamics. And this is a quadratic cost. Okay, So it turns out the, the machinery I use to solve this, I can solve for arbitrarily big systems under the, the assumption that this is a linear dynamics, but it could be a full, you know, complicated linear dynamics, or, or like you could have a, any elements in A and B, okay? Um, and this can be a full quadratic form in the cost function. So that is a, no longer a toy problem, that's a workhorse for robotics. <laughs> If you want your quad rotor to fly around and not fall down, you know, you're going to call one of these methods. There's a, there's a few ways to do it, but a lot of people call it, uh, you know, LQR to do it. Okay, so Same thing we did there, just in the more general form. So now we'll consider any dynamics that can take this form. There's ways to make this more general still, but this is the, the sweet spot. Okay, my LXU, it's my continuous time here, is X transpose QX plus U transpose RU. To keep all the math simple, we want Q to be symmetric. <clears throat> and positive semi-definite. So that notation with the slightly funny looking greater than sign is for a matrix positive positivity. So that matrix wants to be positive semi-definite. But it's okay if Q is zero, right? You might get a boring controller out if Q is zero, or it could be zero in some directions. There might be some directions you don't care about, for instance. It's okay if Q is zero. 
as we just said, it's not okay if r is zero. Okay, so r we'll take to be symmetric, but we want it to be strictly positive definite. That's because you want this min over u to have a quadratic form that has got a minimum. Okay. If you put that into the machinery, then again, I can try to convince you by producing a J star of X is X transpose S X. S is also a symmetric positive definite. And you can go through the same machinery. I'll just, uh, you know, I'll show you the, the, the pieces just so you, it's familiar, but I won't go through the entire derivation here. But um, you're, you're going to need a partial j partial x here. Now, if you haven't done them, you know, taking gradients of matrix equations and stuff is just, it's not hard. It's just you got to kind of do a couple of them and you start seeing that there's a few rules. Um, okay. So this turns out, right, by, by convention, this is the scalar on top, vector on bottom. So I better get a row vector out, right? So I get 2x transpose s because s was symmetric. Um, so you can you know, pop this into your equation here, x transpose qx plus u transpose ru plus partial j partial x, ax plus bu, and that's just, again, that's just 2x transpose s, so that's just another matrix equation. It's really the same thing we did there. It's just a little, a few more terms, okay? Once again, when I see this, I see a positive quadratic function in u. It's now a vector u, but I just see a positive quadratic function, so that's good. I'm going to take the minimum by taking the gradient and looking for it to be zero. There's only one other term that matters. That's the 2x transpose s b u, <laughs> right? It's a lot to say, but not too bad. If I take the gradient of that whole thing with respect to u, then I get 2u transpose r plus 2x transpose s b. I find the minimum of that by setting it equal to 0. And I can find my optimal controller. U star is the 2's cancel. I get negative R inverse. It's OK. R was positive. Had a, it has an inverse. B transpose SX. Now, I haven't actually told you what S is yet. Just told you that once you give me an S, then you better also give me a controller that is this has this relationship to S. Okay, the way you find S is by sticking that back in, and you get a matrix equation in only S. And it's a famous. It's a good a good one to know. Right, so if I plug that back in, I have zero equals x transpose qx plus u star. So I could stick that whole thing back in, x transpose b s r inverse r r inverse b transpose s x. See what I did there? I just wrote out u transpose ru, but substituting this in. One of those pairs can just cancel away. 
Okay. You can write the same thing for the rest of it. You just insert U into that. It's not too bad to do. And you get this very famous equation. So <clears throat> what you get is something that has X transpose equals 0. Inside there is, is the famous terms that we care about here. Since this has to be true for all x, the only way that can be true is if the inside is actually 0, is the 0 matrix. So you get this famous This is the um, algebraic Riccati equation. Sometimes called continuous algebraic because it's the one you get from continuous time. In MATLAB, you can solve it by calling care. Actually, you can call that in Drake too. There's a, we have a well, we spell it out. We, sometimes the, the function names get really long, but they're clear, I guess. So you actually have to call continuous algebraic Riccati equation, um, and you give it a, b, q, and r, and it will return s. It's a, it's a funny thing, right? So if you, were to, if you were to try to solve this problem, how would you do it, right? This is a qu quadratic equation, but in a matrix S, right? So it's, it's kind of not surprising that there's a solution to it, but it, I, I can't. I mean, you can't write it out any better than this. It's a numerical recipe, an iterative algorithm that converges on the solution to this. You know, in practice, we treat it as if it's almost a closed form solution, but it is only a numerical solution up to sort of arbitrary tolerance, but, and in fact, the algorithms that people use are really kind of like value iteration. Uh, they're a little bit more tailored to this problem. Okay, so that'll kick out a solution S. And the K then, the, or the, the controller that you would write would be negative R inverse B transpose SX. That's a lot to say all the time. It's always a, it's linear in X, so we always just write negative KX. So if you don't want to spell out continuous algebraic Riccati equation, you can instead write linear quadratic regulator. A, B, Q, R, and it'll tell you both K and S. K is the one you probably want to use immediately. S is useful for a lot of other things. Like if we want to, you know, we'll, we'll use it to, to certify stability or, or optimality of different functions later. Okay? But this is, you know, this is a function that's available in MATLAB. It's, a fun, it's available in, in Drake. Yeah, sure. It's in the dot, 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 sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. If I were to, you see, I, I get a 2x transpose s a from that one. Yeah, but to, to make sure you have a sub, there's a, it's 2x transpose s a, but the symmetric form of that, I've chosen to, to look over symmetric forms. You have to write out like this. Yeah, thank you for asking. Sorry, I, I, I did slip over that one. 
there any restrictions on DNA, like positivity? Good. So um, positivity is not quite right, but um, so so there's a chance. I mean, what in practice, if you call LQR A and B, and it's not controllable, we'll define controllability carefully in the next lecture, I think, two lectures. Um, but uh, if the system cannot achieve zero cost as time goes to infinity, then the solution to S will blow up and it will not return. But as long as the system is controllable, so that there exists an action that will drive me to the origin in, uh, at an exponential rate, then, then this solution exists. Great question. Yep. In L, like in continuous, what is the analog of like the next state, or like how do you come up with that? It's a rate of cost. So, so that's so that it's good. So, sometimes in discrete, we will write, um, we'll think of it as a cost from this state to this extra state that could depend on both this state and the next state. But you can you can you can write it as just a function of my current state and the current action. That's the first step we need to, to make it more continuous. And that's how I've always written it in the equations. Um, and then it just becomes a rate at which you're obtaining the cost instead of the amount that you obtain after taking some finite amount of time to, to, to transition over the edge. It's really just the, yeah, the, the continuous time limit of that. So it's a little smaller than I would have liked, but if I wanted to, well, then it's super pixelated. Let me see if I can. You would think I could just like, you know, open Apple Plus, but I think all of the, somewhere between my HTML cleverness and slides.com, um, it'll defeat me, see? It'll like instantly resize itself back. That's a little bit better, but not much. I'm at like 200% and it didn't do much. Right? Okay, so if you were to just make your NumPy matrices for the system, A is gonna be, you have to make sure you, fix, you, you realize why that is, but it's zero, one, zero, zero. So that's just saying the first element is just Q dot, and the second element doesn't depend on Q or Q dot. B is just U, zero and U, okay? B times U would be that. I just made, Q is the identity matrix of elements two. That's the same function I, I wrote there. R is just a matrix one. I call linear quadratic regulator A, B, Q, R, K, S, and it'll even print out the LaTeX for you. That was, that's a new feature. Um, it'll print out the LaTeX of K equals, and it, it doesn't actually write square root of three. It, it does like, you know, 1.75 or whatever. <laughs> but, that's oh, it's pretty good. It's at least using like begin matrix and end matrix. Okay, that is, like I said, that it becomes a workhorse uh, for us. And we'll see it in lots of different examples and we'll think through um, you know, how to use it. The more general form of this, we'll, we'll see that you can take a nonlinear system and make a local linear approximation so we have a, another version of the LQR function in Drake that will take any system that you put in. You could put in Atlas, you could put in something else, and you give it a, a, a point to linearize around, and it will take a linear approximation and make a, the controller for you. And that does pretty crazy things, right? So this is, um, I never showed you guys the, oh. this is the version of Atlas that we have in, in my lab that uh, we use for the DARPA Robotics Challenge. You know, the one that does backflips is like the super trim, high-powered younger brother of this one. This one weighs like 400 pounds. If it falls over, it doesn't get back up. <laughs> like, they basically said, don't ever let it fall over because it won't get back up. Um, we did make it fall over once in the competition. Uh, anyway, so but this big complicated robot, we spent a lot of time writing controllers for it and actually the balancing controller uh, that people use on humanoid robots and, and uh, is, is only a slight generalization of these kind of controllers that have to deal with when you're in contact or when you're not in contact. But as a, uh, an example, um, 
actually when we were doing work on proving stability, we made a version of Atlas where we just ignored making and breaking contact. We just put it up on its toe. The cheat was we made a model, well, we made a model saying that the, there was a pin joint between the toe and the ground. So that you could, you could add extra constraints to say, like, don't ever produce a force that would make your foot slide. But in the regime where you're putting enough force down at your toe, that's a reasonable approximation. So we made a, a slightly different version of the robot where the robot's balancing on its toe. Now, there's an interesting problem there of actually finding a configuration once you're in that, you know, that, that is an equilibrium point. So we solved this simple equilibrium point problem, okay, to find an initial condition. We linearize, we call LQR, and I, the, it, the playback, the frame rate is pretty lousy, but you can see it's kind of getting bounced around from some initial conditions, and it's doing pretty non-trivial things, wheeling its arms around, moving its leg around in order to balance on its toe. Just because we solved that equation on a big A and B matrix. Pretty good. Okay, and like I said, people really do use it for um, for quad rotors and and in other examples. Let me take a minute to again to to just break this down. Okay, so. Um, if I'm plotting this, right, when we did plot this a minute ago, the, even in higher dimensions, the picture is going to look like, you know, x1, x2 in high dimensions. There's some quadratic form, which is the level set of that. You know, these are the level sets of that quadratic function, right? They do almost always end up being like this in face space because of what we said a minute ago, okay? And the terms here are super interesting, right? So Sx, you could think of as being partial j, I mean, it is partial j, partial x transpose. So maybe you can see this thing is first and foremost negative partial j, partial x. So if I'm a controller and someone gave me a cost to go function in LQR, the first thing I'm doing is I'm figuring out how to go downhill as fast as possible. That's negative partial j partial x. But life might not be quite that easy. I have a B matrix to deal with. If I'm underactuated, right, then I might not be able to go in arbitrary directions. So B is going to, B transpose is going to modulate this gradient in the direction that I can actually flow. Okay. And then because maybe not all costs or not all actions are equal, maybe it's a lot more expensive to move my arms around than to move my legs around. I'm not sure if that's a good analogy, but if you, if you have preference in terms of which actions cost more or less, if R is something other than just the identity matrix, then that can also modulate the direction you should go down hill. This is like a preference, really. This is the rules of the game from the dynamics, and this is get downhill as fast as possible. Okay, but that's really, I think, the way, the way I want you to think about it is cost to go is gonna, um, it's gonna be like a potential, but in high dimensional state space, it's a map telling you where to go instantaneously is try to go downhill as best as possible, okay? Okay, so, um, well actually, so, so next time I'm gonna um, spend even more, we're gonna do more work on like function approximation versions of these algorithms and it'll be nice, it'll be I think very, in illustrative to see how well, you know, the value iteration kind of algorithms people use in RL research today solve for, you know, the, the known analytical solutions, right? It's actually, uh, you know, they can do pretty well, but if you don't, if you're not careful, you can make mistakes and get wrong answers. So that's going to be a, a useful uh, next time too. But this can also help you write better value iteration type algorithms if you want to, um, you know, if you want to take advantage of this continuous structure, right? So 
let me give you an example of this. So um, continuous actions uh, have this special structure. We saw it in the LQR, but it's more general than just LQR. Okay, so um, if I have control affine dynamics, f1 of x plus f2 of x times u, and if my cost function decomposes or is, is somehow simple in terms of u, let me write it like this. You could write it a, a few different ways, but ooh, geez. Really, all that what matters is that it's somehow convex in u that I could find the, the minimizer uh, nicely. Okay, but let's think about this much more general form. So this is you know complicated dynamics. As long as they come from the manipulator equations, you know. They could be very complicated robots, but they still have this control affine form. How restrictive is this? I, I, I don't know. I mean, most of the time, the interesting parts of the cost, I'm saying you could have an arbitrary cost as a function of state. You could put, you know, pits of despair and mountains of glory or whatever. I don't know. Uh, you can say all kinds of interesting things in X. But if you want to say uh, my preference for control is simple. That's not, I, for me, that's not a big deal. That's like, I, I'm give, I'll give you that. I, I rarely write anything else for that term. And this is where it needs to be rich. Okay, so I haven't given much up, I think, by restricting myself to that form. And what's interesting is if you look now at those equations, min over u, um, you know, LC, XU, I'll just go ahead and write it out. I'll say L1 of X plus U transpose RU plus partial J partial x, f1 of x plus f2 of x u. Then if you give me a cost to go function, even a, an approximation, maybe I'm somewhere in the middle of my value iteration up algorithm. If you give me a, a cost to go function and you want me to solve for the optimal u, it's actually fine, even in the super complicated system. I can still do the same recipe here because x in this problem is a constant. I can just solve, this is just, I still just see u transpose ru plus some other term, you know, s, uh, maybe I shouldn't call it s, a transpose u plus some constant. And I can minimize that. It's a, it'll be a complicated function of x but it's a simple function of u. So in, in this beautiful world of continuous, I can solve this away. If you have limits on u, for instance, maybe this becomes an optimization problem. We'll talk about quadratic programming forms of this uh, soon, for instance, okay? That's a beautiful thing. And it's, it's particular to uh, continuous time formulations, okay? So in most of the time in, uh, I hate saying things that, are, that I haven't fully introduced, but for those of you that do think about reinforcement learning a lot, uh, you know, normally if people have continuous action spaces, they turn to actor critic as an algorithm, okay? The reason is because that min over u is hard. You know, like people don't often, you know, you can use Q learning, for instance, with continuous action spaces, but it's less common. There's a hard problem to solve for that u in an arbitrary setting, okay? But if you know the model, that's an assumption that I've made that, not every, that most people in RL don't want to make, okay? But if you know the model, then you, the policy, given just a, a cost to go guess, you can actually take this min of u analytically. You don't have to like make some hard search over you. I want you to see that that's lost in discrete time. That's not true in discrete time. Even if I had those things, if I had an affine dynamics, um, I'll come over here.
Right, I could set myself up at almost the same game. You know, you would think everything should be the same. You know, this would be the corresponding game, right? I have j of x equals min over u. What happens here is I have j hat, if I will, here, of f, even if I'm x. Right, my u here, which is nice and linear, gets shoved through my j hat, which could be a deep neural network. This is going to be probably a deep neural network, right? So once it gets out here, it's not simple anymore. Now you could say, of course, that you could take a first order approximation of this even in, you know, and, and to try to take an optimal U and that's, that's, that is what's happening. That's exactly what's happening, okay? But it's natural, it, like it's, it's real in continuous time. It's not some approximation. The continuous time, that is the governing dynamics, right? It would be some approximation in discrete time. So the way I see it is when, when you write it like this, it feels convenient for a lot, of, a lot of things, but you're actually, you're losing some of the fundamental structure in the equations, okay? So there's an interesting world of doing, you know, the types of things people normally do in reinforcement learning, but taking advantage of some of this, the structure in the equations and the, the structure of, uh, of control affine, for instance, okay? And we'll do that a little bit more, we'll do that a, a lot more, I guess, on Tuesday. All right, and then the last thing I'll say just to, to uh, transition to that idea is that we, we talked about a lot about continuous time. We talked a little bit just now about continuous actions and how that can actually make things better, not worse. Right? And then, um, you know, for continuous states, the big thing that changes, the equations didn't change. I wrote everything with x's here because that was, everything was in continuous state, but the, the algorithm that you have to, to implement does change because somehow uh, it's easy to represent a discrete state space, a cost to go estimate on a discrete state space just as a list of numbers, right? If there's a finite number of states I could visit, I just remember one J for every one of those states, it's a vector, and I can work with that, okay? But once I have J hat of X is a function, which implies I'm gonna be in the land of function approximation. There are some function approximation that we can say things very rigorously about. Again, there's like the simpler class of function approximators and then you know, the full glory, if I do like a, a deep neural network here, that can be a, a, a very complicated function, but very powerful function, okay? Switching to this, changing from a, a potentially perfect representation of the cost to go on as a list of numbers to something that is not gonna be perfect for every state. I can't represent my true cost to go, even the output of my algorithm. I have to give something up because of my representation. That puts different pressures on that, you know, you have to do a little bit more work to understand what the algorithm is gonna do. You have somehow to say which states are more important, right, for instance. Uh, in order to have a well-defined algorithm. So we'll dig into that a lot um, and connect to the, it, we'll, we'll use neural networks to do that on, on, on Tuesday. Okay, but mostly we made it from discrete to continuous. Yeah? Any other questions on the? Yes. Yeah.
Okay, let me try to repeat that, that question. So, um, you know, there's obvious connections here, even to the equations I wrote on the board, to calculus of variations and, 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 and other tools that are hard stuff. It takes a lot of work to, to, to get around. I tried to make it look easy. Um, <clears throat> those connections are very real. I mean, the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, of course, is, is, is deeply connected. The strongest immediate connection, the, way you, the, the place where you'll see the tools just like snap together, is when you look at a, uh, the optimality of a particular solution. So if you look at the, the variation along a particular tra trajectory about does a change, a variation in that trajectory influence my cost? Does it go up or down, okay? And that actually is the type of tool you can use to prove this one, even though, it goes, even though there's discontinuities in the state. You can actually say along every trajectory the variation is zero in the, in the along the optimal cost. So there, all those tools do work. I think um, I have I have. We'll talk a, a little bit about it um, when we do trajectory optimization. Pontryagin's minimum principle. Minimum is the the place where you're going to see them snap together the the most clearly. And they are more general tools that, can, that don't make assumptions about everywhere differentiable value functions and stuff like that. But in this case, um, it's, it's a PDE and it's um, in the LQR. L the LQR is like a magical case where it, it's pretty good. There's a lot of variations on LQR too that, that, that can, um, can get you pretty far. I'm happy to give you more references if, if, uh, if you want more. Yes? between the trajectory optimization and, and, and that. So um, there's a long answer to that, of course, but uh, uh, it, depends, it depends how long, how much, uh, how dynamic you're trying to be, okay? And there are, um, there are simpler representations that people use that where you can solve long-term planning problems, just thinking about center of mass and angular momentum, whatever. And then often when you're now translating these simple models down into the the brass tacks, you know, the actual details, you solve a problem that looks more like this, but has to think about the friction con constraints. Uh, so it's a constrained version of these kind of problems. So they are very connected. It's only, there's a, there's a few logical steps you have to take to get there, but I guess the, the simplest answer is yes, I'm willing to say that. Um, the most advanced trajectory optimization that we could do on Atlas, we didn't use very much on Atlas, at least during the competition, because we were afraid it was gonna fall down. Uh, so you, there's also a concern about what you can be comfortable, what, what you can guarantee is going to work. Um, we'll talk about that for sure on the, in the legacy. Okay, great.